few brief announcements this morning. Uh, just a quick reminder that there is still a Sunday school that meets at 9 a.m. every Sunday morning. The ladies meet in the overflow room, and the rest of us uh, adults have, are here. And children, uh, there are Sunday schools for all ages that is held downstairs. Uh, Mondays for men uh, will be meeting tomorrow. However, Pastor Bill will be out of town, so he will not be leading it, and he will therefore also be canceling his office hours for tomorrow. It's just for tomorrow, correct? Just tomorrow. So he'll be here next week. Uh, <clears throat> and then, Pastor Sean, has your new schedule been figured out yet? Um, yeah, but not this week, so maybe <laughs> next week I'll have my office hours. Okay, so Pastor Sean will not be having his office hours this week. Uh, also, very briefly, too, uh, Joy Club has moved to Tuesdays at from 4 to 5 and will be held here. Uh, that is, again, to encourage older children to come on out. Uh, fits their schedules a lot better. Next month, next Sunday, next Sunday, it's already here, it's Mother's Day. If you're already planning, or if you're only planning today, or if you're starting your plans today, sons, you are too late. Uh, <laughs> again, there are flowers for all women, and that'll be collected. And also, uh, next week is the last week, we'll, we're going to be collecting the baby bottles for the Alpha Pregnancy Center. So if you have those, again, please uh, remember to bring them in for next week. And then Tuesday, May 14th, will be Moms and Munchkins. And then finally, uh, you might have noticed if you picked up a bulletin, there's a little insert in here about the survey. So uh, we've been announcing it a few times. Uh, we've been taking up the offering. There's an outside box that is uh, hooked up to the wall there. Well, we'd like to know what you think. So. Please, uh, if you have not already, and if you are a frequent member here, an attendee here, please grab a bulletin and fill out the survey. It's a one-question survey, simple yes or no. And uh, what we'll do is you'll fill this out, and we'll ask you to just put it in the box. Notify when you're there. Yes, I know. But nonetheless, uh, please do, and then that way we can get a sense of where everybody is regarding how we take up our mm -hmm. offer. Okay. Uh, any other announcements I missed this morning? Okay. In the meantime, uh, this is the month for the call to worship, and this week's reading is from Matthew 5.21, so I'll ask you all to stand in honor of God's word. So Matthew 5.21, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. Matthew 5, 21. Now open us up in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you uh, so much for, again, the opportunity to worship before you today. Thank you, Lord, for all those who were able to make it out today. Father, for those who are at home because they are ill, I pray for their speedy recovery so that they could, again, join in worship and fellowship once more. Lord, for those that uh, <clears throat> for those that are not saved this morning, I do pray for them that you would open their hearts, that you would open all of our hearts, and that our praise and worship that will be happening here momentarily would be well-pleasing to you. And Lord, I also pray that as we approach the communion table today, that we would remember what it took just to have fellowship and communion, not just with you, but with each other. And that, and that sacrifice would be at the forefront of our minds today as we worship you and prepare to partake together. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Good morning, saints. Good morning. Good morning. As we, when I look at these, these songs that we're going to be singing this morning, it's just a 
Bless him. The first one that we'll be singing is M154. What a friend we have in Jesus. Many of us do not have that type of friend. But Jesus is a friend that will never ever leave you or forsake you. So let us sing this song to the glory.
The more recent, the more recent one was not thyroid. It was uh, it, it was endometrio endometriosis, <clears throat> and that one that surgery has also gone well. Yeah. And I forgot to bring that as an update. Sean, I see you had your hand up. Pray for the little children who are not here. Yeah, we're missing Lisa and the their girls. We are also missing the whole Fertilock girls, uh, mom and the girls. Mm -hmm. And uh, about the only little ones we got left are these two. So that's uh, we're, when you're missing that many girls, when you have a little, when you have a, a tribe like that in a church like this, that's such a major, yeah. a major hole in our congregation. So we certainly miss these kids. <clears throat> and the uh, worst thing is, I saw Sean's girls yesterday, and apparently Sean's girls and I had the same problem last night. High fever, coughing, and uh, mm. so, yeah, I had 101 plus fever wow. during the night, and this morning I'm fine. Well, I'm not fine, but I'm good, okay? Yeah. Don't even go there. <laughs> so, all right. So, uh, we will bring all that before the Lord in prayer this morning. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us out this morning. We thank you for being such a good God. Amen. In a world that is crazy mm -hmm. in so many ways, we have the truth. We know that you are the way, the truth, and the life. We know that you indeed have the only source of eternal life. You give that to us. <clears throat> and Father, with all that there, we sometimes ignore you. We don't recognize the goodness that you have for us mm -hmm. on each and every day. But we thank you for those things this morning. And this morning, Lord, we certainly miss all our children. We miss the Fercolette girls. We miss the Haber girls and the moms. And it's, it's tough when you just don't see this amount of life that we normally have in this church. Mm -hmm. So for those that are sick, we ask that you will return them to full health and do so quickly. And for those who uh, have, been, have been exposed, I pray that you will get the problem resolved quickly and, and not come down with symptoms. <clears throat> we put those before you. For our son Chris, we pray that he will this time get better. And uh, when he gets released from the hospital this trip, he will be home, and he'll be home for good. Father, as we worship you this morning, we pray that you will be praised and glorified in all the things that we do. Now we take a moment out of the busyness of our life. We take a moment where we open our pocketbooks and we return a portion of what you have given us to you. Whether it's large, whether it's small, it's a portion that we return to you. May it be given of a pure heart, and may it be used well here or wherever we may choose to send it. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
morning again, saints. We will be singing two songs this morning, and they can be found in your hymnal. And the first one that we will be singing, first praise song that we will be singing, is 338, Wonderful Words of Life. And that 338, I don't know if we have it on the screen. Oh, yes, it's on the screen up there.
turn your Bible to Acts chapter 10, the second half of verse 23 begins the next, uh, the next paragraph. Actually, I'm sorry. This, uh, yeah, second half of 23. <coughs> The next day, he rose and went away with them, and some of the brothers from Joppa accompanied him. And on the following day, they entered Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them, and had called them together, his friends and relatives. When Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up, I too am a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many persons gathered. And he said to them, You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone from another nation. But God has shown to me that I should not call any person common or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without objection. I asked you then why you sent for me. Hmm. And Cornelius said, Four days ago, about this hour, I was praying in my house at the ninth hour, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard, and your alms have been remembered before God. Send therefore to Joppa and ask for Simon, who is called Peter. He's lodging in the house of Simon, a tanner by the sea. So I sent for you at once, and you have been kind enough to come. Now, therefore, we're all here in the presence of God to hear what you have been commanded by the Lord. Let's pray. Father, as we look into this passage, this is kind of the, the race down to the finish of this little episode within the book of Acts. And we pray that we will see what you have for us this morning. See here clearly how we are to use it in our own lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We've been watching this law called Collision Course develop for some weeks now. It's been moving on. We see it now picking up speed this morning, racing on toward its conclusion. We will again invoke the thought that God rewards those who diligently seek him. That would apply to Cornelius. And Peter thought we'll remind us or remind ourselves of Peter. He had learned to not tell God how to do his work. <laughs> and that just seems to be something we're going to see. We're going to see more of that, not with Peter, but we're going to see that with some others of the Jews who now compose the church of Jerusalem. We'll see that uh, someplace in the next several weeks. We also return to some of the things we looked at earlier in the preaching of this passage. We talked one time about the keys to the kingdom being given to Peter. And you know, we, we have Peter preaching the gospel to the Jews at Pentecost. Holy Spirit descended. Thousands were converted. Okay, we have Peter meeting with John, or going with John, meeting with Philip the Evangelist in Samaria. And the Holy Spirit descended on the believers there. This is we see every time we see the keys to the kingdom, so to speak, very visible with Peter. But we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Okay? But now he heads for Caesarea to the Gentiles who are anxiously awaiting his arrival. We have a very simple outline this morning. Well, it starts out simple anyway. Uh, Peter responded obediently. Let's start there. Yeah, it took some convincing, but he finally got with the program. But here's something that we see that went along with it. Peter went with a handful of other Christian men from Joppa. They went along with him to Caesarea. Now, that's a pattern, not doing things alone. It's a pattern that began with ministry of Jesus back in the Gospels. Jesus would send his people out two by two. He'd send them out in groups. And that was the safer way to do things. 
It's always good to have witnesses to what you do. Someone else to hear the conversations you have. It's also good for verification and validation. Make sure everything is going the way it's supposed to be done. It's also sometimes, you know, I might forget something. It's nice to have somebody else with me in a conversation. Uh, but it's also good for accountability and encouragement. It's so nice to have someone else working with you if you're in ministry. To do something alone is really tough. I've often seen people who try to do what I call lone wolf ministries. They are the sole person in their ministry. Mm. They don't often have the greatest of successes. They're not even connected to churches very often. I had a conversation recently with a young man who wasn't even connected to a church and he's trying to establish a ministry within his own home dealing with Jehovah's Witnesses and dealing with Mormons. <clears throat> and, and he's trying to do that without the backup of a church, and he's not well taught himself. That's a problem. <clears throat> Contrast that to men like Billy Graham. Billy Graham never had a credible accusation against him for any kind of a moral failing. Why? Because he had a team surrounding him a team of faithful men, faithful people that surrounded him and made sure nothing like that could ever happen. Mm -hmm. It's just, the, the accountability thing is so big, especially in today's environment. So they were way ahead of their time. They're gonna go out, the men from Joppa, half a dozen men from Joppa are going to Caesarea with Peter. Next stage is Cornelius waited expectantly. Now think about this. It was four days from the time Cornelius had the vision and sent his servants off to Joppa to retrieve Peter. Four days. That's a lot of time to start building up anticipation. How's it work today? You want to make something happen, what do you do? Take out your phone, <laughs> you send a text, you set up a time and you have a Zoom meeting, right? It's instant. This is four days. So they have all this time to get this. What was the messenger going to tell him? It must be important. After all, you know, Cornelius had a vision of an angel. That was where the message came from. Maybe now in four days' time, he talked to some of his friends in the synagogue because he was well-known in the, in the Jewish community. Maybe he heard a little bit about this Peter guy. We don't know what had happened. Okay? We will find out in chapter 11 that there was more to the conversation with the angel than what we have seen so far revealed. Okay? We'll get to that when we get into chapter 11. What he knew, though, what Cornelius knew was, whatever this message was going to be, he wasn't going to keep it to himself. Think of that. He was going to share this with other people who were important to him, family and friends. He brought them in, and he knew what time to expect them back. He knew how long it would take his men to get to Joppa, and how long it would take to get back from Joppa, and he had them there waiting in his house. And then they met respectfully. <laughs> and this is where I get to invoke one of my favorite illustrations on good communication. Okay, my illustration comes from the movie The Princess Bride. It's the only thing I know of the movie The Princess Bride. Good communication, and I have been taught well in communication, Good communication involves an introduction, establishing common ground, and an expression of expectation. And in Princess Bride, in Princess Bride, you have this wonderful short statement: "My name is Indigo, Con Indigo Contoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die." <laughs> like I said, it's the only thing I know from the whole movie, but it makes a great illustration for that. <coughs> So we get there, or Peter gets there, he explains his 
reluctance to be there originally. Ah, oh, this wasn't my idea. God had to tell me very clearly to send me here. But I overcame my resistance and I was obedient to God and I came. And uh, it's all about this Gentile home. Peter's upbringing is a strictly raised Jew. They didn't involve themselves with the Gentile cultures at all. He had some hang-ups there. But he had this specific call to action here. And he knew he had to violate Jewish practice to do that. And he explained all that to Cornelius and his friends. <clears throat> we could easily argue here that the fact that Peter made this trip directly into the home of a Gentile, a Roman soldier of all things, <clears throat> he made the trip there. This is one more indication that when Jesus on the cross said, it is finished. All the issues of the law, all the little bitty things that were almost impossible to fully comply with, were resolved. He met it all. He met all the requirements of the law in his death on the cross. We're no longer bound by the sacrificial system, the details nearly impossible to keep. And then it starts out rather curiously. Cornelius began to worship Jesus. The text tells us he bowed down to him. <clears throat> the word for worship there, the word, the Greek word that underlies that is proskuneo, which means to pretty much fall on your face in worship as though to a deer. That's the idea of that word, the idea behind that word. And Peter went, whoa, no. Not going to happen. I'm a man just like you are. And that means it's time we have to take an excursus. <clears throat> For those of you who don't know what the word excursus means, that's a fancy word that really means rabbit trail. <laughs> We're going to take rabbit trail. <clears throat> and I don't like running rabbit trails, but I promise you I will bring it back and go right back into the message. We have to make this brief, brief deviation from the direct point of the lesson and deal with this, the issue of Peter being worshipped and refusing worship. We have to do that because Peter is considered to be what? This is a rhetorical question that you can answer. <laughs> what is Peter considered to be by the Roman Catholic Church? First poll. Okay? All right. Think about the activities of, regarding the Pope. Just think for a moment about how the Pope is worshipped. Okay? And the thought has widely invaded Western culture. Even some among evangelicals understand that Peter was the first Pope. Well, we will acknowledge that most likely he was the bishop of Rome at one point in time. And we'll acknowledge that. And I say most likely because I tend to agree that that's the case. <clears throat> but was he the pope? Was he the overall head of the entire church of that day? I would give you a resounding no. Remember that Peter was an apostle. Just remember that. Peter was an apostle. Excuse me. One of the things within the Roman church is the Pope and the Cardinals have what they say is apostolic authority. I've read this book many times. Take my word for that. There is no indication anywhere within Scripture that the apostles passed on their authority as apostles to any other men. And now we have this lineage of apostolic authority within the Roman Catholic Church. <clears throat> and that's a problem. Even if he held the bishop of, of Rome, that position, if, if he had that, he was still an apostle. Remember that. 
He had the right to make statements that were authoritative, but his successors did not have that authority. And his successors today, as they are assumed to be, have no authority, and they certainly, certainly have no right to be worshipped. Think about what happens when people go see the Pope. What do they do? Bow down. I saw you kiss his ring. They fall down on their knees and they kiss his ring. That is the behavior that Peter denied. Don't do that. I'm just a man like you are. That's, that's an issue there. When we look at our morning text here, um, back to where we just read. When Peter entered, Cornelius met him and he fell down on his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up, I to him a man. That does not happen within the Roman tradition. <clears throat> He's also called, the Pope is also called, the Vicar of Christ. Anybody here? We have a lot of people here who come out of Roman Catholic histories. Ever hear that term, the, Rome, the Vicar of Christ? No? Do you hear it? You know the term. You know the term. Okay. <clears throat> okay, what's it mean? That's a question that most people who use the term or are familiar with the term don't know. It's a title of the Pope, and this is from the Catholic Answers Encyclopedia. A title of the Pope implying his supreme and universal primacy, both of honor and of jurisdiction over the church of Christ. Another authority with a more of an evangelical slant, calling the Pope the vicar of Christ implies that he has the same power and authority that Christ had over the church. And if you take those statements and you take this morning's reading out of our text, and add to that something that Peter wrote in his first letter to the church. So I exhort the elders among you, as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Okay, and it goes on from there. A fellow elder. That's the position Peter identified as. A fellow elder. Bishop Presbyteros, whatever term you want, however you want to translate it, <coughs> those are terms that he considered himself part of. So Bishop of Rome, yeah, and probably he would have gone with that one. <coughs> Though Peter himself spoke and wrote with apostolic authority, he related to and behaved as an elder. The way we are organized as a church, Pastor Sean and I are the elders of this church. Okay. The entire rank structure of the Roman Church, Pope, Cardinals, Bishops, Priests, is really modeled after the Roman government system. Because as the Roman Empire spread, the Church spread. And as it spread, it took on the structure of the Roman Empire, particularly the Roman army. Uh, and I'm not trying to engage in what I would call Catholic fashion. <laughs> but while I'm here, and since we're on this rabbit trail anyway, I had this question just last week, so I will answer it this morning. What about the matter of naming saints? What about the matter of naming saints? According to one authority, there are 67 uses of the word saints, plural, in the New Testament. Plural. The one time it's not in the plural, it says every saint, which means each and every one of the individual saints. This morning, Stanley got up, and how did he greet the church? Good morning, saints. Yeah. In every biblical case, it refers to the believers in a specific area. Okay, a specific city or region or culture. The word underlying it in the Greek text means set apart. The set apart ones, that's what it means. Set apart because they become believers in the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is no biblical warrant 
to establish criteria for and a pattern of developing sainthood for an individual. Okay? As I was researching this, I found in the BBC News an article from 10 years ago that lays out the pattern the Roman Catholic Church uses to establish sainthood in a person. Okay? And it lays it out very well. It's very simply written, very well written. It's, uh, like I said, BBC News. It's from April of 2014. <clears throat> and it's humorous in some ways. In some ways, it's... In some ways, it violates so much of what Scripture says. That said, is it evil particularly to refer to Peter as St. Peter? Mm -hmm. <laughs> John is St. John, Mary is St. Mary? Probably not. I mean, I often refer to Augustine, but just as often I refer to him as St. Augustine. Okay, same guy. But he's known throughout history as St. Augustine. <clears throat> is it evil or not? <clears throat> but it does tend to make an artificial level of distinction between those people and St. Diane, St. Ryan, St. Hannah, St. David, St. Henry. You, you see what I mean? According to scripture, if Peter or Paul were writing to the church in Amsterdam, he would be saying, to the saints in Amsterdam. And we would be inclusive of that group. <clears throat> the other saints that are very often brought into question are the other original apostles, the other actual actual apostles, I should say. <clears throat> and we have a pretty good history, all from tradition, where they went, what they did, and how they died, with the exception of John. John died a natural death. He's the only one we believe died of old age. <laughs> okay? <laughs> or disease related to his old age. And the rest of them died martyrs' deaths. Are they noted, noted for that? Are they worthy of a little bit of maybe extra honor? Yes. But it doesn't mean we make them saints, and it certainly doesn't mean that we make saints out of the rest of the people the Roman Catholic Church has made saints out of. Okay. Back to the lesson. Cornelius explained the start of the sequence of the events that brought them to this point. And if you read this piece of it, all of a sudden you recognize that he doubled up on a piece of information in there. He says, four days ago at this time, at about the ninth hour. See what he did twice? At this time, at about the ninth hour. <coughs> as I was praying. <laughs> it seems from what we're seeing there that Cornelius had a pattern of regular prayer. Every day at three o'clock, he was in his house praying. I think that's significant and it's something we need to take a lesson from. <laughs> he feared God, he prayed, and he was rewarded for that. <laughs> and then he says, now, therefore, we're all here in the presence of God to hear all that you've been commanded by the Lord. Cornelius very well understood that this wasn't Peter's message that was coming. This was a message from Peter's mouth, but it would be the word of the Lord that they'd be getting. Essentially, that verse says, okay, let's get down to business. This is what you came here for. We can almost feel the nervous anticipation in that room as Peter draws a deep breath, surveys the crowd, and if you've been paying attention to my thread about the keys to the kingdom, you can hear the key being slid into the lock and start to turn. And I'm gonna leave the story there for now, and I'm gonna go into application. How do we see ourselves fitting into this picture? We've dealt with a matter of obedience a couple times, not going to beat that one to death anymore, except to say 
we must not forget that God was gracious to Peter, even if he was a bit hard-headed. I resemble that remark. Okay? <laughs> I, I tend to be a little hard-headed. God has been very gracious to me. Most of us, if we sat down and analyzed our history and our Christian lives, would say, yeah, God's been very gracious to me. Amen. <laughs> and what? Yeah, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. Peter was a slow learner. I tend to be a slow learner. Uh, but I've gotten to the point in life now where I would hesitate to hesitate acting on his direction. You hear that correctly? I would hesitate to hesitate. It's taken a lot of years to get that way. I go, no, 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 not this way. Not that. I, I'd rather do it this way. But now I think I'm catching on finally. But let's ask some questions. Are we expectant? And there's some context for this. The first expectation or place of expectation. Do we come to church expectantly? Hmm. This is the place where I might be stepping on some toes. <laughs> and if I am, one guy I like to listen to says, if you can't say amen, you ought to say ouch. <laughs> <laughs> Are we coming to church expectingly? Expecting first to worship. That's the big thing. We come to church to worship. And yes, we are going to receive a blessing, but that's not the reason we come. We come to give glory, honor, praise, assign value to our God, our Savior, our Creator. That's why we come to church. We expect to hear His Word. Or do we? If you really expect to hear His Word, have you read the text? Most of our regulars, most of our members get the email that Liz sends out every week, usually Tuesday or Wednesday, that has the bulletin. And the bulletin has everything the bulletin has. It has the text of the morning's preaching, and it even has the outline. How many people look at it? How many people look at it? I don't need to look at it because I wrote it. Okay? <coughs> The rest of you, have you really looked at it? When you come in and sit down here in the morning, I know a few people that sit down, and maybe they haven't looked at the bulletin, but they look at it when they come in, they look at the text, and then they read the text. Now, I understand the pressure of our daily lives. Truly, I do. I have a hectic life. You may not believe that because theoretically I'm retired. We know how that's worked out, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> tired all over again. That's mm -hmm. usually the way that works. Okay. I understand the pressures of hectic lives. And I understand the pressures of busy Sunday mornings. Especially those families who have children. I do. I get it. And I know there will be days it's not going to work quite the way you'd like to do it. But... Are you coming expectantly? Cornelius' guests were no doubt there for some amount of time before Peter and his entourage arrived. But that built the sense of anticipation. Mm -hmm. Are you waiting to hear what God will say to you? Not what I'm going to say to you. Not what Sean is going to say to you. Are you waiting to hear what God is going to say to you? Mm -hmm. Because it's his word that's going to be revealed and exposed before you on a Sunday morning. It's not any great wisdom we have. It's God's word. Start preparing for worship the evening before. When I was a kid, different culture, I know, a long time ago, a galaxy far, far away, <laughs> the night before, what we do? We got on our shoes, we polished the shoes, we made sure our clothes were laid out, made sure that they were ironed. Remember we used to iron clothes? <laughs> uh, my mother would iron clothes. We made sure all those things were ready for the next morning. That went away. I'm 
I'm not saying all that's bad, but that went away. Okay. But it built a sense of anticipation. Okay. If you can't start participating or preparing the night before, at least get up 20 minutes, half an hour, an hour earlier on Sunday morning and get it done. Get your heart, your mind, and your clothing, if necessary. And you, you know that we're not crazy. We don't really care what people wear. Communion Sunday, the men wear ties. <laughs> okay, that, that's about it. Other than that, I say the, the, the deacons and the pastors. Uh, but you know what? The rest of the time, we don't really care what anybody wears. <clears throat> okay, but we want you to be here. But we want you to come expectingly. If you come expecting nothing, you will surely meet your expectations. And to quote my friend Bodhi, if you can't say amen, you ought to say ouch. How about at home? Are we expecting God to be involved in our daily lives? Or are we expecting Murphy's Law to rule the day? Now, I am a firm, I'll even say I'm a believer in Murphy's Law. I know that no do-it-yourself project can be accomplished without at least three trips to the hardware store. Right, that, that's just a hey, Lee's nodding his head over there. He's been an airman store. And he works at a hardware store. Okay? <laughs> he still has to go there and he stays up. And you know, this is reality. We have those things. I just take it as a part of my day and, and just go on about my business. But I start my day with scripture and prayer. You can start with prayer, start with scripture. I don't care which way you do it. But they're necessary components of my day. If I don't start with prayer and scripture, my day does not go like I'd like it to. It just doesn't. I've learned that kind of like Peter, you know, I had to get hit in the head an awful lot of times before I finally had mastered that. Yeah, I, I had to take a long time to do that. Listen to Christian music, some sort of uplifting music. Listen to Christian speakers on radio. Most people have Spotify or Amazon or some other form of social or you know media music. Excuse me. You can get it. It's easy. Visit with Christian friends. Call them on the phone. Chat with them on a text. Whatever. Maybe have a gospel conversation with a non-believing friend. Yeah, I know, that one takes guts, doesn't it? If you expect to see God show up in your life, you might need to do that once in a while. And finally, in prayer, are we expecting God to hear our prayers? Are we expecting God to answer our prayers? Or are our prayers just a matter of habit and ritual? Mm. Do your prayers sound the same every day? Sadly, I think probably many of us have that as a pattern. That's just the way life is. And I'm going to ask if we are respectful. Once again, I might step on some toes here. Let's start off with our behavior at church. I'm going back to that. Think of the others who are around us when we come into church. Mm in the time before the service begins. Just think about that for a minute. Somebody else might be sitting here with a load on their mind. They could have had a financial disaster that mm -hmm. week. They might have had a health disaster that week. They may have had any kind of a personal disaster that week. And we're rattling and rattling and rattling and rattling and rattling on and on and on. Mm -hmm. Part of the reason for our prelude in the morning is for people to come in, yeah. clear their minds, clear their hearts. Mm -hmm. But when the deacons go in there to pray and Diane is playing the organ, that's the time when you should be thinking about now's the time for me to be quiet before the Lord. Amen. And once again, if you can't say amen, you ought to say ouch. <laughs> and how about when you just 
you, when you do have conversations with people coming in the door or afterwards, downstairs over fellowship, coffee, when you have conversations with people, are you really listening to what they say? Or are you talking to the same people week after week after week, people you know, you've seen each other Saturday afternoon, or you've seen each other Friday night, or you're going to see each other later today or tomorrow morning. How about people you don't know that well? Are you respectful of them? And instead of going, how are you doing? Which, what, what's the proper response to how you doing? Just fine. Right? Isn't that the norm? How are most people really doing? <laughs> how are most people really doing? Most people have some kind of an issue. Might be a little issue, it may be a great big issue. And anything in between. There's one guy, another guy I like to listen to, Herschel York, a professor at uh, Southern Seminary. And he says, there is no problem so great that it cannot be solved by a suitable application of the gospel. Find a way to have a gospel conversation with the folks you talk to. How is God dealing with your life? How can I pray for you? You'd be amazed at how things would work up if you give a little bit of respect. And that's not necessarily just in church. But that goes in a lot of other contexts. The real need all people have is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Christ died for sinners. <clears throat> Many people don't know that. Many people may even think they know that. They pe might think they have come to a knowledge of Christ. They may have said a prayer someplace. They thought it was some magic formula. Oh yeah, I saved, said a prayer, I'm saved. Well, yeah, really? You tell me what God's doing in your life. Well, uh, I don't know. Trust me, that happens more often than you care to think about. See, true faith, true salvation comes with repentance, confession of sin, and then it's followed by obedience. Okay. Jesus bought salvation for us, and out of our understanding of what he did for us, we are obedient to him. That's the way it all should work. <clears throat> Those of us who know Christ, all of us, have the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Mm -hmm. Anytime we're talking to someone who is not saved, we have the ability to put the key in the lock and turn the key. Think about the great, great obligation and privilege that is for each of us. And I put all that pretty much waiting for the end of the message. We need to be saved. We are about to engage in the Lord's table. This is our time of communion. When we join with all saints, see that, all saints, of all time, and we engage in this celebration of the body and blood of Jesus Christ. But only people who are true believers in Jesus Christ should partake of this. If you do not know Jesus Christ, please do not, not take the elements. Just let the plate pass. That's fine. But if you're a believer, this is for you. And if you're not a believer, but you've heard my words this morning and you have decided that I really want to be a believer, you can, even now, in your seat, you can trust Christ. You can call on him for salvation. Call on him for repentance. Call on him to be your Lord. And if you do that this morning, mm -hmm. it's certainly within the helm of what we are doing here to join us in the celebration of the Lord's table as we do that. As I pray, take a few minutes to think about these things, and uh, then the men will come and we'll distribute our elements. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you for this message from the book of Acts. And when we look at it on the surface, we think it's just a kind of a light and fluffy story, but it's not. When we examine it for what it means to us and how we need to apply it, it can be kind of touchy. It can be kind of ugly, actually. It can be convicting, and it's supposed to be. So Lord, as we look at it and how it applies to our lives, first of all, for those who have never trusted you as Savior, have never come to you for repentance, have committed to confessing sins and becoming a child of God, that would be my prayer that that be done this morning. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and anyone else, Lord, who's got something going on in their mind and their heart, I pray that they would take the time now to get rid of it, to deal with it. If you've got <laughs> unconfessed sin in your life, deal with it today. Commit to repenting of any sin that is dogging you in whatever way it may be. <clears throat> If you have problems with, with a neighbor, problems with a loved one, problems with a friend, this would be the time to confess that and repent of that as well. And then go forward joyously and enjoy the celebration of the body and blood of Jesus. I put these things before you now. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Scripture tells us in the Gospel and then again in 1 Corinthians <clears throat> where Paul recites it. In 1 Corinthians, Paul is not just telling him how to do it. He's telling him how not to do things. Because 1 Corinthians is a letter, a love letter to a church. Because churches can get a lot of stuff wrong. So he's trying to correct some of their policies and their procedures 
in the service of the Lord's Supper. And he says, what I've received, I deliver to you. And I was betrayed. Jesus took the bread, and blessed it, and then he passed it. I'm going to ask Lee if he would ask the blessing on the body. The Lord said, this is my body broken for you. <coughs> and he willingly let himself be sacrificed for forgiveness for all of our sins so that we would not have to be broken, that we would be made whole. As we break this bread and we consume it, we remember his sacrifice. We remember the promise of life everlasting and death was promised to us through his sacrifice. Take this in his name, amen. amen. And as they did, and the night was betrayed, let's all eat. And following the bread, he took the cup. <coughs> and after asking God's blessing on that, he passed it to each and every one of the men who was there. Stanley, what can I ask you please to ask the Lord's blessing? Sure. Again, Lord, we truly want to thank you for this special time spent in your presence. We think of your spread table, the bread, the wine, the bread which represents your body, the wine, your blood flowing. We thank you for the sacrifice that you have made for us, O oh God. And here we are this morning celebrating your death, your burial, and your resurrection. This morning we can truly say to God be the glory. Great things he has taught us. Great things he has done. So love ye the world that he gave his one and only son. Thank you for that sacrifice, dear Lord. And as we celebrate, Father, your death, your burial, and your resurrection, we just want to say, blessed be your name. Pray in all these things in Jesus' name. <clears throat> And as the cup was passed, they all drank from it. Let's do likewise. <clears throat> and then they sang a hymn. In closing, as we sing in one, seven, two, can you please take your hymn now and rise as you close the session out.
for the gift you gave us in your son. Thank you for the celebration of the Last Supper this afternoon or this morning we just did. We ask you now to bless us, dismiss us with your blessing. We pray that you will also bless the time of food and fellowship we have immediately following. We thank you for those who took care of setting us up this morning. <clears throat> we ask the time that we have. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you again. Thank you again for coming. Please come back next week and enjoy the fellowship that we have downstairs.